Excellent. Thanks, Kev. Um, so yeah, my name is Chris Pont. I am the CEO, uh, CEO here at EG. Um, EG are a bespoke software delivery data and business intelligence consultancy. Uh, we were formed back in 2014 and we've been working with uh, a number of customers, uh, both locally, such as Ipswich Building Society and uh, much wider afield. So I'd like to give you a, an introduction into digital transformation. Um, and I'm always amused at the different definitions uh, for the word digital and digital transformation. And I, I know um, a few years back, there were over 100 CIOs that were surveyed and they were asked what the word digital meant to them. And they came up with 100 different definitions. So, you know, clearly there's a bit of amb ambiguity there. Um, and many organizations have a, a digital department, you know, especially the larger ones, um, and that encompasses different assets, different technologies, etc. But I like this, uh, this, this quote from Salesforce. So they define digital transformation as the process of using digital technologies to create new or modifying existing business processes, culture and customer experiences to meet changing business and market requirements. Um, so this can mean anything from, from digital assets such as websites, e-commerce, web chat, self-service platforms, uh, you know, or, or to form new customer channels. But it can also mean some internal things such as implementing Office 365 or I think it's just been rebranded to Microsoft 365. Um, and that's to ensure that employees can collaborate effectively using enhanced versions of the tools that they're already used to. So Word, Excel, PowerPoint, along with things like SharePoint, Teams, Microsoft Stream, video platform and and um, you know, things like Azure Cloud um, you know, and, and, and the management tools that come around that to help them manage employees and their, their digital assets. So it could also mean shifting finance inventory systems into big um, enter enterprise resource planning systems, so ERPs, and, and that can mean huge uh, endeavor and massive organizational change. So there's, there's different scales to digital transformation. And it, it clearly, it can mean different things to different people. And that sudden rush towards um, taking advantage of these digital tools has, has sparked four key issues, really. And, and in some cases, they've kind of become afterthoughts in the rush to keep employees working and businesses productive. Um, things like training, cost control, resiliency and, and security. You know, that's something that we see as, as potentially issues within organizations where you know, people are going to have to go back and, um, and and assess their security tactics, make sure that things aren't scoped to large groups of users uh, where, where they're leaving big gaping security holes. Um, and it's also Im important to, to think about both the customer and the employee experience. So do employees have everything they need? Do they have access to everything they need? Do they require training? Are processes in place to handle that whole end to end or have these tools and technology has been put in place with employees expected to to sort of fill the gaps and are customers aware of the change do they know it's coming are there clear channels for them to engage uh, and i've seen many of these projects put in place in the past where um it wasn't quite as slick as it could have been and there's been sort of a, a sticky plaster put in place to bridge the gap between the legacy and the new world and that's resulted in a, a less than ideal customer experience and you know quite frankly a customer support headache so that's um you know that, that's something to consider as as these digital transformations take place uh could I have the next slide kev excellent thank you so as many of you may well well know we've we've conducted a survey of over the last couple of months um so that was gathering insight into how covid19 has affected both business as usual and future digital transformation work so, you know, what effects has that had? Um, have, have organizations managed to react and keep their workforce productive? And, uh, you know, have they been able to collaborate effectively? Has it um, sped up their digital transformation plans? Has it, has it meant that, you know, they've had to react quickly? Or has it slowed things down? Has it meant that there's more pressing issues and they've had to put some of those projects on hold? Um, so yeah, there's employee, there's insight into their employees' thoughts on how their organisation has managed this process, which has been quite interesting. You know, what what do the workforce think of how their business has has put these new tools, technology in place? Have they received the right training, etc.? And we we had over a hundred participants. We're using something called Microsoft Forms Pro, which is again in true Microsoft style, has just been rebranded to uh, Customer Voice, um, and that's been a really useful tool for 
for getting that survey out there and getting people to to engage and, and give us their thoughts. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Kev? Excellent, thank you. So there's been some interesting highlights, and um, Tim Tim's going to go into a bit more detail later on um, this morning. But um, so some of the the key highlights for us. So over 90% of their uh, of workers gave their employees a four or five star for effectively enabling home working. Yeah, that's fantastic news. Um, you know, and, and really quite surprising. Uh, and it proves that this sort of thing can happen at pace if necessary. Um, you know, people have had their hands forced here, but it, it 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 really does show that you know if we need to get moving, we really can. And um, then there may have been some calculated or, or or possibly uncalculated risks involved here. And those four key issues that I spoke about earlier: so training, cost control, resiliency, and security. You know, we may need to revisit those now um, that something's in place now that people are are working and maybe just um, lock things down. Um, you know, save costs where possible and deliver training to, to staff so that they can make the most effective use of those tools. 73% um, of, of organisations uh, were immediately able to establish remote working. Um, again, this was a, a surprising one for me. Um, I know there's quite a few organisations out there who whose remote working policy basically involves uh, VPNing into an on-premise uh, office. And, and that, that may work for 20 or 30 workers, you know, who are working from home occasionally, but it becomes pretty shaky when you've got four or five thousand employees all dialing in to the same connection. Um, and, and obviously those those businesses were over able to overcome those hurdles pretty quickly so that they could keep their their workforce moving. 92% um, of employees were given access to all the data, information and systems required for effective home working. Again, you know, fantastic. It, it means that, you, you know, there wasn't a great deal of pause involved for for these employees um, but again a key consideration here is security of the data and the systems making sure it's scoped appropriately and and it may be necessary to audit those permissions those firewall rules and, and now that staff are working effectively make sure that there are no holes that would provide a risk to the business um, 74 percent report that their technology had proved to be extremely reliable again you know the resiliency issue that i was talking about um you know, you know this is a, a, a great stat and i think on this note it's it's really important to give credit to people like microsoft and zoom and and webex for the way that they coped with this rush and that they were able to keep those tools for that collaboration up and running and i know microsoft teams in particular they scaled from 560 million calls a day on the 12th of march to 900 million calls per day on the 16th of March, to 2.7 billion calls per day on the 31st of March. You know that's that's incredible scaling even by Microsoft standards. And um, you know the platform held up reasonably well. We we make extensive use of Teams, and you know we've only really noticed a few short-lived blips in 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 how Teams has performed. So you know, again, fantastic news, and it really proves that you know incredible things are possible when 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 really necessary. Um, and 94% said that productivity has either improved or, or unchanged. And, you know, that goes to show that working patterns have changed. And in many cases, people feel they've become more effective. You know, they're able to work a bit more, um, make, make their working patterns change according to, to how they live and work from home. And it'll be interesting to see if and how that changes as people take advantage of this new way of working going forwards. You know, maybe in six months time, 12 months time, if people are still working from home, are they still seeing those uh, productivity improvements? Um, are they able to work in the same way when the workforce or em employees have moved around, have changed jobs, um, when they haven't been collaborating with, with people in person? Does that mean that, you know, suddenly they're not seeing such productivity levels anymore? Um, and I think on that note, I'm handing across to to Jim. Oh, actually, no, sorry. There's a the survey results and reports. So, so the survey results um, and and the, the the press release that's going out on Thursday, the 10th of September. Um, and there will be an al analysis available on our website, um, and a full copy of this report will be sent to all participants of this WebEx. Um, there's a complimentary half day consultancy for all webinar attendees as well. So. If you're interested in interested in taking that up, 
uh, please get in contact um, and we can talk through a bit more about um, digital transformation and particularly how this is affecting your business and, and, and what you have on the radar. Brilliant. Thank that, you. That, that Thanks, Chris. Me. Back to Kev. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, thank you, Chris. That was, that was good. Let's hope that all well, that praise of Teams scaling and reliability hasn't they've jinxed it for this webinar. If it can hold on at least another 45 minutes, then we'll be happy. Um, right, with that, i pass over to Jim to take up for our main element. Um, obviously, yes, Chris has just done a great load of um, some of the positive elements. Tim will be along a little bit later to talk to some of the, the less positive areas that came out through in the survey. Um, but prior to that, Jim, please take it away. OK, thank you very much. Hopefully you can all uh, hear me. Um, right, good morning, everybody. I'm Jim Overy. I'm the head of IT and change for Ipswich Building Society. Uh, I've been working in technology now for about 30 years, uh, the last five of which have uh, been at the society. Over the next sort of 15 minutes or so, I'm going to give you some background into the society's digital transformation programme, what we were trying to achieve. Um, and then obviously most recently the impact of the pandemic and what's that, you know, how that's impacted our journey. So first off, a, a little bit about the society. For those that you don't know Ipswich Building Society, uh, we've been in operation as a mutual building society since 1849. Uh, and basically we provide help for our members to buy homes and save for the future. It's a relatively uh, simple business model. Um, although it does have its complexities and we've been successful delivering both of those services now for obviously for quite a while. So why have a digital transformation program at all? Well, nobody really could have missed that financial services uh, has changed across the globe. Um, and, you know, with that, the expectations from our customers and members on how they interact and transact with us is also changing. Uh, the rise in sort of challenger institutions, you know, who are built from the ground up as digital centric services um, and the shift to digital engagement for mainstream financial service providers has created a sort of new normal for what customers expect for servicing and interaction. As an established mutual society, though, we have a duty to our members to ensure we continue to grow into the future. So as such, we can't ignore this shift that's going on around us, especially if we are to remain relevant in the marketplace and continue to attract members to to our business. But we've on a bit of a sort of sword edge there because equally we don't want to lose sight of who and what we are and what makes our members want to be part of our society. As a community focused business, we don't want to lose the trust and personal engagement we have with our members. And that can be extremely tricky in a digital world. So our digital transformation has been as much about developing efficiency and strengthening our back office operations and services, delivering a robust mechanism to process data securely, enabling us to make the right business decisions and prepare us more for the new online on demand services, which will ultimately complement our important personal interaction that we do at the moment. Next slide, please. So pre-pandemic, the society had started its journey on a it started its journey on a significant digital transformation program. And as Chris mentioned earlier, it's not just about you know the technology side of things. It's about enhancing services which are core to providing a stable and secure and scalable infrastructure as well as service. You know, dim, digital transformation is not just about buying shiny new tech. But that's always obviously very nice. Um, but looking at how the business is leveraging or most likely not its current technology investment and how technology can drive efficiency and develop that customer experience. So as a business, we've looked to understand how we're utilizing technology and data within society to understand if it's fit for purpose, is it effective? And actually more importantly, is it meeting the criteria for our growth? Um, what's the business itself ready for? widespread technology change or any change can be complex and you know your internal culture might not be quite right so there may be some additional work there and how and if our culture and attitudes about technology need to change and what areas of the business are sort of ripe for that digital innovation like many established mid-sized businesses our use of technology had been purposeful so desktop services provided staff with the very minimum they needed to do and they didn't really lend themselves to sort of collaborative working. 
our infrastructure has, was quite old. It was very, very inflexible. Um, and like most businesses, we'd created a sort of raft of homegrown solutions and a spreadsheet mounting within these environments, which simply could not scale. But as a business, we had become completely dependent. So our digital transformation then had to start at the roots of the services we were offer and the services that we were doing within a business itself and the systems that underpin them. Before we start to make any sort of push into enhancing that sort of online customer experience, we had to look at the technology that we had in place at the moment and see whether actually we needed to change those services, adopt new technologies, or you know, simply just refresh the services that are underneath. So when looking at our technology, we considered the tools and services that we had that we'd, we'd use to enable our staff to collaborate more and support their roles more effectively. Look at the way that we process and interpret data to ensure it was robust enough to support digital services, especially considering the velocity and quantity of new information that digital services were likely to deliver. Looking at our processes and systems to make sure that they provided or could provide a consistent streamlined customer experience, irrespective of the medium they chose to engage with us. So society has always viewed online services as a complementary means of engagement for our members, and it was committed and still remains committed to maintaining a branch network. That face to face element is extremely important to us as a local business. And service improvements must therefore serve both digital and traditional interactions. And we wanted to also make sure that we maintain the high standards of trust as we expand services, especially digital services. And one of the big things for that, of course, is cyber threats are continually evolving and create a significant new threat for financial providers. Trust is a vital pillar of why our members choose the society. So we have to make sure that we can instill that same level of trust where the threat landscape is vastly more accessible. So adequate security must underpin everything that we do. With the, uh, the digital transformation program, we've also sought to address the issue of long term sustainability of the platform. The adoption of market leading scalable technologies, including public and private cloud services, coupled with the expertise of companies like EG, we have sought to drive innovation and provide vital upskilling to our own technical and business teams so we can continue to maintain and develop those services under our own steam. Slide transition, please. And it's not just about the technical challenges. Along the way, we have added hurdles of assessing and managing risk to ensure as a business the change we introduce remains within appetite. We must address regulatory compliance. The use of third party outsourcing and cloud adoption was particularly hot topic for regulators and assessing our providers and solutions, ensuring we have due, adequate due diligence. And finally, we have to manage the change, minimizing the disruption and ensuring staff have adequate training to use the transform services effectively. All of this in a structured program of work presents a challenge. However, in 2020, we have the introduction of a new spanner in the works which added some significant complications just for good measure and provided a unique opportunity to validate the steps we had already undertaken as part of our program. Nothing could have demonstrated more the value of digital services, of digital services than the COVID pandemic. For us, it is unfortunate that we are currently not in a position to offer an online service to our members, but that does not mean that the digital transformation we have current, we've already undertaken to this day has not benefited our members hugely. And if we had not made the specific technology migrations we had, the impact on our business would have been much, much more severe. Next slide, please. The foundation technology and service changes have allowed us to mobilize almost our entire workforce for remote working. They enabled us to maintain all of our services with minimal interruption. In fact, the only disruption has been caused by the B2B services that we use, and they've been outside of our control and a direct result of the lockdown. What makes this a remarkable achievement is that this is all accomplished using tools and services which the majority of our staff were unfamiliar with and in a work environment to which they were unaccustomed. With the lockdown and social distancing being enforced, the first challenge of the pandemic was to get our back office staff operating effectively at home. 
that has not always been pretty or easy. And having the technology to allow people working remotely is something we are used to and prepared for. The change was the type of people and role, the scale and the pace of deployment of our new workforce, our new remote workforce, sorry. However, you know, and that came as a bit of a surprise. Home and remote working was typically restricted to a very small number of roles and only around 15% of our staff had laptops or remote access. Staff were also prepared or not prepared to work from home. The first of these pictures demonstrates fantastically one of our staff members unique home office configuration um, and the others demonstrate again the challenges that some of the home workers were faced. The projects we'd undertaken to revise our core network services allowed us to quickly scale up both our remote connectivity and the bandwidth to support that additional significant jump in remote workers. However, the technical ability to scale the service is pretty insignificant in comparison to the deployment and support of new home workers. This demonstrates beautifully why digital transformation is not just about large scale IT projects. Whilst we have a system that could scale to support the demand, we didn't necessarily have a workforce that could easily utilize it. You know, we struggled like many businesses to purchase home working technology, laptops, headsets, etc. And typically home working is generally a very full, well thought out process. The business has established that the role suits home working. The individual has allocated an area in their home which they think is suitable for work. They have established that they have the necessary internet services to support their requirements and they understand how they're going to communicate with their colleagues and their teams. The pandemic took all of those considerations away and threw in some new added complications for good measure. Households with multiple individuals competing for that same workspace, if it even existed, slow, congested and unstable internet connections, and a myriad of other distractions to impede good communication. Partners at home, juggling childcare, pets, deliveries, and staff were unfamiliar with remote communication. Who hasn't had a conference call with someone on mute, not having their camera switched on, the wrong camera switched on, etc. So if we leave aside the logistics of getting that desktop service into the person's home and the domestic hurdles that need to be overcome, as a technology function, we still had three significant challenges. You know, does our remote policies enable every business function to operate effectively? And are there risks of operating those services outside of our controlled office environment acceptable? What additional mitigations or controls are required and what functions cannot be achieved remotely? Secondly, we had to look at how the technology, what we could use as a technology to enable the virtual office. How do we get staff to utilize tools and services they are unfamiliar with, are now vital to main productivity and communication? Slide transition, please. And finally, the most important, how do we maintain the security of our data and protect our staff from an increased threat of cybercrime brought about by the pandemic? The first of those, for us was relatively simple due to the broad nature of the established home working roles and the standard build very little was required to open services for remote workers enabling the majority of staff to have all the necessary software and access to hand once connected at home for many the shortage of laptops meant that they were working on their usual office pcs and we decamped most of our office hardware out to people's homes so everything was very familiar to them and because of this we were operate on our core systems very quickly of course, not all business operations lend themselves to remote working and being identified as a key service enabled us to keep a very small contingent of our staff at head office and at branches to address physical activities, such as providing counter activities, uh, counter services to our members, facilities management, post and document scanning. Next slide, please. The adoption of a virtual office has been an interesting one for us. As I mentioned earlier, this is as a society, we have not really had a large remote user base. And more importantly, we have not had the broad adoption of video calls, desktop calling, instant messaging, or even collaboration platforms within our normal office environments. People were so used to, to peering over a desk or walking around the office to speak to colleagues. And like most businesses, we also like to have a meeting or two. So, for some time, we had had the tools as part of our digital transformation, the move to Office 365. We had the tools to do all of this within our suite. However, the appetite across the business to utilize them had all been almost non-existent. In fact, the only department really making use of tools like Teams, Planner and SharePoint were the IT team. 
So for the first month of lockdown, it was a crash course in using that technology for communication and collaboration, collaborative working. Teams has been a huge eye opener and has fundamentally changed the way departments and colleagues interact and cooperate on tasks. It has established itself as the medium for communication across the business, serving as an important surrogate to essential face to face contact, which has become a vital part of staff well-being while in isolation. The adoption of technology into our mainstream business as usual activities has also driven some significant process improvements. Departments are leveraging the productivity benefits such as co-editing, screen sharing and planning. The COVID incident management team have used the tools exclusively to plan and collaborate on business continuity and assess and share government guidance. The technology team have used tools such as SharePoint OneDrive and Teams to provide remote support and guidance to our internal customers regularly sharing tips and tricks on how to get a more engaged user base keeping or keeping them keen to leverage new tools to work more efficiently as an organization we always had we always had a presumption that many of our roles required a fixed office or even close proximity of team members in order to for them to be productive but what the adoption of this technology has demonstrated is that that greater flexibility can be attributed to many of these roles without any negative impact on productivity. The final challenge is actually the most important, which is security. As a financial services provider, we have an obligation to keep our customers data safe. The turmoil created by the lockdown meant that many people were caught off guard um, as they focused to get you know, people operational. And it can be very tempting to circumvent good practice in order to get a vital function operational. Again, for the society, the investment we had done in cybersecurity was a crucial part of that digital transformation journey and was central to every project within the programme. And we continued unapologetically to, you know, testing our staff on cybersecurity throughout the initial confusion of enabling them at home, subjecting staff continuously to phishing simulations to continue to heighten their awareness keeping security at the forefront of their minds, especially given the increased uh, reliance on communicating digit digitally as we had dispersed teams. As a technology team, we escalated awareness and advice and recognising the increased vulnerability that we had to both our services and our staff. Next slide, please. So finally, for me, a couple of observations and takeaways really about the last six months. First transition, please. Um, what's been surprising for me, as Chris pointed out earlier, is from a technology perspective, how reliable the technology has been, even given the sudden surge in usage and the unique environment that COVID has created. As a technology leader, this has helped me to validate the decisions we have made so far in our digital transformation programme. And more importantly, it's actually strengthened the case for its continuation. Next transition. The technology adopted has created a change in mindset and perception on how to get the job done efficiently, with, efficiently within our business. The ability to work productively while remote has huge benefits for both the business and staff. Reducing unnecessary travel from commuting and meetings leads by itself to utilising more time productively. More efficient use of office space has the potential to significantly reduce costs. But companies must proceed with caution as not everybody wants or can work from home. And the social interaction of an office environment we find is still very key to many people's well-being. For us, eliminating the need of printing documents has driven a welcome use, you know, has been driven by a welcome use of the technology to collaborate, mark up and share, which see hugely reducing both our paper usage and the waste that we generate. But there's obviously very many more. Many staff want to continue to work from home on a regular basis. And as a business, we have to understand what that hybrid office environment looks like and how it will work post pandemic. From an operational resilience perspective, as a business, we are now reevaluating how our staff and roles will operate. The demonstrated rise in productivity cannot be ignored, but we also can ignore the challenge this has been for some staff. So finding the right balance for both the society and staff is key. This change in working practice means we also have to look again at some of the aspects of our digital transformation programme to ensure they still hold a beneficial outcome for us. And this has been highlighted in some of the short term priorities that we've needed to change. Last transition. As an immense business continuity exercise, the pandemic has taught us that the provision of a broader, flexible working policy can work for us. 
And this is already leading us to reevaluate business continuity plans. Uh, and it's, it is obvious that the traditional decamp to an alternative location is not necessarily the most effective means of resuming operations in some scenarios. This enforced change has demonstrated the remarkable resilience of both our society and its workforce, and the workforce is generally across the country, to adapt to new working practices and technology, and for its ability to accept and conquer that challenge. Our digital transformation program continued throughout this pandemic, many projects continuing with little or absolutely no impact. However, we are looking closely at each part to assess its value and how its priority is effective post COVID. The Digital Transformation Programme remains an important strategic investment for us. And while it's had a few tweaks in the last six months, you know, our commitment to the overall strategy you know, remains unchanged. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for that. That's great. Yeah, whistle stop tour of a, of a very hectic six months of activity there within the society, like most organisations. Um, I particularly like the stand up ironing board workspace, actually, to be fair, I may, maybe one to adopt. I'm not quite sure when you then get your shirts ironed. That might be a bit of a challenge. Uh, right, with that, we'll pass over to Tim um, to take us through a little bit more around some of the technology and some of the some of the less optimum answers that we got in from the survey and some of the insights that that brings as well. Thanks, Chip. You need to come off mute. I knew I'd get to say it at some point today. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Nash. I'm a principal software consultant at EG. Uh, next slide, please, Kev. So uh, a little bit about uh, our journey. Uh, so improving our business continuity plan was already a focus at EG. Uh, although we didn't really have a global pandemic in mind, we were thinking more perhaps if there was a power cut at our office or uh, we weren't able to otherwise get in. Uh, so as part of that, we had a, a rolling rotation uh, where people at, at short notice effectively uh, last thing the day before were told that uh, the next day they were working from home. This allowed us to uh, test uh, what it was really like for people to, at short notice, not be able to be in the office. Uh, although at that time we were effectively operating a, a hybrid environment where some people were in the office, other people were working from home. We were also looking at moving away uh, the, from the physical infrastructure that we had in our office. So we, we have a number of servers which we use to provide uh, infrastructure. Uh, we wanted to move those out of our physical location uh, into our cloud environment, which again meant that we weren't dependent on a physical location. Next slide, please. So the technologies we use, uh, as uh, I think Jim already mentioned, uh, we're using Microsoft 365, which was Office 365, uh, to provide our, our Office suite of tools. We also use Teams extensively. Uh, generally, we don't use that many emails internally. Uh, everything happens over Teams. We use Microsoft uh, Azure Cloud for our uh, virtual infrastructure, uh, VMs, things like that. We use Microsoft DevOps as our platform to manage work uh, that the software development teams are, are working on and interact with uh, stakeholders within uh, our, our clients. We use uh, Microsoft Power BI uh, as well as uh, producing Power BI uh, solutions and dashboards for our customers. We use it internally to uh, measure uh, our performance and provide the executive team with uh, uh, dashboards uh, by which they can see how the, the rest of the business is performing. In, in a, a normal world, we would uh, make extensive use of uh, post-it notes, uh, particularly when we're doing inception workshops or uh, working with groups of people to uh, throw around ideas, things like that. Uh, our walls are in the office are frequently covered with post-it notes. Uh, that doesn't transition so well to a virtual environment. So we use uh, a tool called Trello, which allows us to have a shared board in real time uh, with people who aren't located in the, the same uh, space. And we use a tool called Office Vibe, uh, which is uh, effectively uh, a tool which allows us to kind of micro survey uh, our employees every week people get a, an email uh, prompting them to uh, answer kind of five quick questions about a particular area of the business and that uh, allows us to monitor uh, employee engagement and get a, a feel uh, for how the workforce is is feeling uh, across lots of different areas 
uh, that then gets collated into dashboards which we can view and look at trends over time and look at what areas we need to address. So hardware wise, uh, we'd already transitioned people away from desktops uh, to laptops. Uh, most of our laptops are Lenovo. And we also provide uh, Plantronic headsets uh, as we feel that uh, when people are using that uh, over uh, calls, it's important that they have a, a good quality of uh, audio, uh, both that they're uh, being picked up through their mic and also it allows you to focus, particularly in a, a, a busy home environment. Uh, having that uh, fed directly into your ears rather than through speakers uh, means that it's it's easier to concentrate. Next slide, please. Kim. So uh, going back to our survey, uh, what's next? So just over half of uh, home workers said, uh, sorry, just over half of respondents said that home working would play a partial role in their future working practices, whereas 42% intend to retain their new home working policies. When you combine that with uh, one in uh, only one in four UK workers wanting to go back to the office full time after the pandemic subsides, we're going to end up with some sort of hybrid uh, workspace whereby some people are working remotely and others are working together in an office location. Next slide, please. So uh, the death of the office is unlikely, uh, despite what uh, some articles have said. Uh, according to a, a Deloitte survey, when people work in their usual workspace environment, they like the, the social interaction. Uh, they are more collaborative and uh, they network more easily. Uh, Jim already mentioned some of the uh, sort of mental uh, well-being uh, that, that you get from interacting with, with people in the office. You also get uh, tacit knowledge transfer. So uh, it's those conversations that you, you might overhear that otherwise you wouldn't be partial to that that information in a, in a good way, obviously. Uh, the things that you didn't know, you didn't know. And those chance conversations that you might have kind of going to get a coffee. You also, I think, end up with uh, a better uh, getting to know your, your fellow workers uh, a bit better. So we're going to end up with a, a more agile and a flexible workforce. And I'd also call out that, that remote working uh, is, is not quite the same as home working. Uh, with the pandemic, we've all been forced to work from our homes, uh, but remote working isn't necessarily working from your home. Some people, uh, as uh, Jim's presentation saw, were perhaps working from the, uh, the end of their bed or uh, crouched at a, a kitchen table. Uh, for people who have particularly long commutes, uh, re remote working, maybe working from uh, an office workspace near their home, but uh, avoiding the, the hours of a commute to and fro the office. The next slide, please. So 98% of respondents said that their technology had enabled them to work uh, effectively during the pandemic, which is great. Uh, but since the start of lockdown, uh, three quarters of office workers have used at least two new types of technology for work. But how uh, is that that training and adoption being rolled out across the business, particularly when uh, for a lot of companies, including uh, EG, we made use of the job retention scheme and furloughed some of our workers. Uh, how is, is that new technology and that, that new culture uh, changed? Uh, to use an example, uh, we've been using Teams for uh, a long time. However, it was very unusual for us to have uh, our video turned on when we were uh, on Teams calls before the pandemic, whereas now that's just a given. As soon as you join a call, you've, you've got your video on. And that was a, a slightly awkward transition, uh, which Chris, our CEO, encouraged us uh, to, to go through, uh, to sort of go through that uh, slightly awkward barrier of, of having a video on when you weren't used to, uh, used to having it on. Uh, how, how is this sort of new world we're, we're living in? How, how are the, uh, the people who uh, have not been in, in the workplace at the moment, uh, how are they going to be uh, adopted into that, that new environment? Next slide, please. So that there's, there's also been strain and stress. Uh, nearly half of respondents said their existing IT projects had uh, been delayed uh, and 11% uh, believe lockdown had put them considerably 
behind plan. When you combine that with uh, over a third of tech professionals have seen their mental health deteriorate as a result of the crisis, uh, there's, there's been a lot of pressure in this uh, enforced uh, digital transformation that we've we've all had to go through, which uh, in a lot of cases has been largely unplanned and we've been reacting on a on a day to day basis. How are we going to uh, get projects back on track uh, at the same time as not uh, further damaging the, the mental health of our workforce? So uh, next slide, please. So the, the next steps uh, are probably to uh, review the technology that uh, you have adopted, uh, its long term suitability, uh, the security and the, the cost optimization. Does it make sense in, in the long term? Then to, to take stock of digital transformation strategy and uh, look at your new hybrid working practices. Uh, it all works fairly well if people are all on uh, the same video call together and we're all sitting in our own homes. But once people are in the, the works, uh, workplace uh, and perhaps in a, an office meeting room, it doesn't tend to work quite so well when uh, some people are together and you've got a, perhaps a small video camera uh, in a meeting room and then you've got some people working from home uh, on uh, the, the experience is, is not as good uh, so that that may involve uh, investing in some new technology uh, better video conferencing equipment or perhaps even people working from their desks even though they're in the same uh, the same environment uh, not being together in a meeting room but joining the, the call from their desk instead you also need to understand the impact to IC, uh, uh, IT projects and, and the budgets and perhaps consider uh, external assistance to help get those projects back on track, which is perhaps a, a good time to mention again that the half days of uh, complementary consultancy that EG are offering to provide to uh, get, get uh, an expert's view and uh, someone from the outside to come in and, and look at what could be done to uh, get those IT projects back on track. Thank you, Kev. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to all the presenters. We've actually run pretty much bang on time, which is which is nothing short of miraculous as well. So because we certainly didn't um, sort of rehearse it by minute by minute timing. Uh, what few things just before I open up to uh, Q&A on here is can ask the questions when we get to the Q&A, so be thinking of them now either by chat or, or audio. When you do so, it'd be you know, helpful if you're able to just um, give your name, either your role or maybe your organisation, if you, know, if you're comfortable sharing that information. Uh, but don't forget to unmute yourself as well in order to ask that those questions, or at least if you're having any trouble, turn your camera on and wave or whatever it may be in order to attract attention. We'll try and help you and unmute. You will receive a short little feedback survey around this webinar as well. Also remember, we're repeating this webinar tomorrow at five o'clock um, in the evening to give those that are more of an end of day person rather than an early start to join. So, if, um, well, maybe you want to have a second hit at it and like to come again. But also, if there's anyone in your in your network or colleagues that you think would benefit from it, please feel free to you know to share the information with them, uh, which you'll find on our website. The survey results, the information around our podcast and the restart festival will all be landing in your inbox as well, along with further details so that you can get in touch if you'd like to take up the free consultation that we go through. There's also a, a case study that we're just about to publish as well around the work that we've done with Jim and the team at Ipswich Building Society, which will be going live on our website again, similar probably by about Thursday. Um, so you, know, you can have a read and have a little bit more of the detail of the, you know, the, the small and the, you know, the part that we've played within, within Jim's team and their journey. With that, I'll open up to questions from the floor if anybody's got any otherwise I'll be forced to um to put some people on the spot with a question don't forget you'll need to take yourself off mute um in order to do, ask a question this is that awkward moment where we wait to see if anyone's got any questions I'm trying to spot if anyone comes off mute OK, whilst people are thinking up on um, any any questions, I've got one that I'll ask to the floor, which everybody can have a go at answering um, answer this one. And this has not been rehearsed, so this is this will put them on the spot. Uh, so looking back over the last 
five six months of you know this this different way of working i'm not going to use that the, the new normal world oh there you go i've used it now um what's the number one lesson you've learned which can either be from from your role as a as a as, a, as, a, as a, um, employee uh, owner stakeholder in the business etc or it could just be from a from a personal perspective what's the one lesson you think is learned that you you do differently perhaps next time who would like to say that first don't forget to take yourself off and mute i'll give it a go um i think a lot of it is not down to the technology weirdly um you know it's digital transformation but it's more about the people and i think um with that you you can't communicate too much um you know we we, we thought we were doing what we could there so um you know i was recording regular video updates to send out to the team um but it's an uncertain time for people so you know they want reassurance they want they want to know what's going on um and they want details on what new technology you have tried to introduce or or what changes have been made so you know with the it, it isn't about the technology you've got to make sure that you've got training in place uh, that you communicate effectively um and and that you you definitely bear the people in mind and again that's where the office vibe tool that tim mentioned that's been really useful because we could we could spot any issues we could spot um you know trends in some of those metrics where you know they were deteriorating for certain things we could tell that you know potentially people needed more attention from their line manager or um you know they, they weren't feeling satisfied with their job and all these metrics are um, anonymous so office vibe doesn't actually um, put people's names against any of the responses which is great because you get more honest feedback that way but it it means that you know you, you're looking at more of a group view of how people have been affected so you can spot, you know, any any trends across the whole organisation, or or break it down by department. But yeah, it it's not about the technology; it's it's about the process and the people. Okay. Well, Chris, anybody else? Yeah, I'd I'd echo oh. what Chris is saying. Actually, we've found that it's absolutely been the people that have been the most surprising aspect of all of this is that how quickly they've uh, you know they've adapted to change. Um, like I say, we've not been a particularly strong technology driven business. So, you know, for us, throwing all of these new features and toys and tools at them has been, you know, for us was always a bit of a panic beforehand, how we were going to roll them out, how we would get people familiar with them, how they would get people using them. But actually being thrown in at the deep end a little bit, the people have been amazingly resilient. Um, but equally on the flip side of that, again, you know, people, some people have struggled with regards to the whole home working situation, that isolation piece. And I think the technology has helped to sort of soften that a little bit. Um, but from our perspective, it's just been a, it is the people that has, has really sort of made this. Just building on that, uh, it's, everyone's different. So everyone, re everyone responds to this situation in different ways. Some people absolutely love it. Some people hate it. Some people would much rather be back in the office. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this rush to try and get everyone back on prem in the office, um, you know, that works for some people. It doesn't work for others. So yeah. you, you have to bear that in mind. I mean, we certainly had discussions, you know, about what it meant for the sort of home working when all of this kicked off and, you know, how we were going to get people back into the office. But actually, as a as a management team, we've actually we wanted to follow the government guidelines and actually have nobody returning to work if they could operate remotely, carry on working remotely. But we found a surprising number of people that actually have really pushed to return back into that normal environment, that, that, that is sort of safe working environment back into the office. So it's uh, it, it, it's sort of gone the opposite way to what we expected. We expected it to be a huge drive for everybody wanting to work from home all the time, but actually that's not happened at all. Okay, thanks. Anything you want to add, Tim? I might put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, for, for me, it, it was really important to be intentional about everything because you don't have those kind of chance conversations anymore. You, uh, and so if you want to to speak to somebody you've literally got to well uh video call them uh, or th things weren't going to just happen by chance you, you had to make sure that they happened good thank you uh, yeah i mean i i think my side i've seen that you know what effectively you can do and is the traditional change run book that the organizations have had have worked on many IT projects over over the years, both large and smaller, um, in different sectors and organizations. The pace, this has proven that businesses and individuals, you know, the resilience of people to change is so much 
greater than perhaps the, the than we'd have given everybody credit for. And so I think, you know, when you're looking at some of these digital transformations projects now, the speed at which an organisation can change, you know, look at the changes in government and that in some of the processes they've had to introduce new abilities to you know, claim this or claim that or do this, you know, has massively changed. You know, there was no trial for this. There's been no test, no pilot run or anything like that. So to prove that this sort of thing could be done in almost in production environment in, over rapid time, is the, is, the, is the impressive yes mistakes are made along the way but you know that isn't that part of being agile fail fast you know so i think it's yeah i think that's been i think for me the key key eye opener okay um we are coming up to two minutes to the hour so i'm trying to keep sure we keep on on time if there's no questions from anybody on the on the panels on the boards then we will wrap this up to a to a close um as mentioned keep an eye on your inbox some further information. Definitely please encourage you to complete the survey because that allows us to focus on how we run these in the future, how we improve, um, and also you know, invite other other guests and other guest speakers and that as well to bring to what you want to hear about, what other things we'd like to run. These sort of type webinars are, are about you know sharing people's knowledge openly, sharing experiences, and hopefully helping everyone in their in their day to day activities and their roles you know, learn from some of the some of the mistakes and some of the issues that we're, we're finding as a as a broader industry. And with that, I'll just finally thanks again to, to Jim and all of the presenters and that today from EG and wish you all a good day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.